Hi, Sister Kathleen. Thank you for being here with us today. Well, I'm very happy to be with you. I love the college and I certainly am very happy to meet with some of the students from one of my favorite places in the whole world. Great. We're going to start with self-introduction. So we're going to go around, say our name, our major, and something we love about St. Joseph's. And then you can be the last one to give a little information about yourself at the end. Okay. So I guess I can start. I'm Natalie Fanthorpe. I'm a child study major, and I love the location of St. Joe's. I love the neighborhood, and I love the trees right now in the fall and seeing the seasons play out on the campus. Uh, I'm Riley. I'm a biology major, and something I love about St. Joe's, I think, is the community. Everyone I've spoken to there is just very welcoming and nice, and it was easy to fit in, so... Uh, my name is Louisa. I'm a psychology major and criminal justice minor. Um, one thing I like about St. Joe's is the size of it because I like that it's smaller than most colleges because I feel like we all get to know each other really well and I have a more personal relationship with all my teachers. Um, I'm Matthew and I'm a marketing major and my favorite thing about St. Joe's is very similar to them. I just like that it's a tight-knit community and you get to know your professors on a like one-on-one -on -one basis. And I love the community as a whole too. Everyone's been very welcoming. Um, my name is Edwin. I'm a biology major. And just as the same as them, I also like the community in St. Joseph's. And I like how the teachers are really nice and help out. And I think I have to concur with all of you, even though I'm from the dark ages of St. Joseph's. Um, I'm Sister Kathleen McKinney, and I was a chemistry major at St. Joseph's, and I loved the community. And one thing that I actually said at a, a Board of Trustees meeting last year is that um, people know if you walk in the door or not. People know if you're there. And I think that makes all the difference in the world. So it really alludes to what you were all talking about, which is the sense of community. You make it, each person makes a difference. Great, thank you. So before we start, I'll just read this little snippet. This okay. report was made as a part of the oral history project by St. Joseph's College Brooklyn Campus Honors Program students in the fall 2021 semester. It was recorded on Friday, November 19th, 2021 at 12.30 p.m. The interviewers are Luisa Bianco, Edwin Castillo, Natalie Fanthorpe, Riley Ann Finch, and Matthew Nima. The narrator is Sister Kathleen McKinney, SJC class of 1971. Correct. Okay, so for our first question, um, we just wanted to confirm that you attended St. Joseph's from 1968 to 1971 and received a degree in chemistry with a minor in secondary education in 1971. Well, actually, I, I sent a little bit of a correction to Mayumi. And um, actually, I started St. Joseph's in 1965 when I graduated from St. Savior. And I went there for a year from 1965 to 1966. And then I entered the Sisters of St. Joseph. And I went to the college out in Brentwood for three years, but then I came back in 1969 and I attended St. Joseph's again uh, for two more years until I graduated in 1971. So actually I have quite a unique perspective because I was there when it was St. Joseph's College for Women for a year, and then I came back right after it was went co-ed. So I saw it from, uh, as they say, both sides now. Okay, well, that's interesting to know. So, but you got your degree in chemistry, I believe, I right? did. I got my degree in chemistry and my minor was in secondary ed. Yes. So what was the science department like during your years at St. Joseph's? Well, it was, uh, it was small, but it was a wonderful department. Uh, the teachers were top notch. They really were. It was amazing. When I went on to get my master's, um, 
a number of the teachers said, where did you get your undergraduate? You have such a wonderful foundation. And believe me, it wasn't due to me. It was due to the wonderful teachers that I had, Sister Mary Meyer, Sister St. Francis. Uh, they were just wonderful teachers and I absorbed it. But it was really less to do with me than the wonderful teachers that I had, Sister Corday in physics. So um, the department had great teachers. The people, uh, the, the majors, uh, you know, the students, we, we got along very, very well, but the students in, in general mixed very, very well. The department itself was a very, very fine department. The teachers were very approachable. Um, it, it just, it was just such a great place, but the chemistry department was really a very, very fine department. That sounds very similar to how it is today with my experiences in the science department. Right, you're so, the biology major, right, Bradley? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm a bio major. So for uh, the chemistry like major, I know that today we have to take chem general chemistry, organic chemistry, and calculus. Were there similar requirements when you were getting your degree or were there different ones that maybe aren't used today? Well, we had to take general chem, we had to take organic, we had to take inorganic, we had to take physics, we had to take biology, we had to take geology, and we had to take a couple of other courses that I can't quite remember. We had to take calculus, but uh, if you remember, I, I went to St. Joseph's for a year and took an advanced math as as a um, as a uh, a freshman, although I wasn't a man, I was a woman, so I like to say fresh woman. But uh, in my first year, I, I took a math class. Then I went out to Brentwood, and they didn't have chemistry as a major, so I had to switch to be a math major out there and elementary ed. So I had to take all of those credits. So I actually took four courses in calculus out there and then I had to come back. So I took calculus, but then I had to come back to St. Joseph's and take the other required courses. So I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on exactly what the requirements were, but I know it was general chem, organic, inorganic, physics, geology, calculus. Um, there were a lot of requirements, but there, was all, there were also the core requirements of the college because remember it was a liberal arts college. So we had to take the English courses, we had to take philosophy, we had to take theology, history, it, and at that point, I got a BA, which is kind of counterintuitive uh, for a chemistry major. But right uh, after that, they changed it to a BS. But I was always very proud that I got a Bachelor of Arts because uh, it was a liberal arts college. Yeah, I think it's pretty similar to today, except I don't know if geology is a requirement anymore. But... Yeah, I had to take geology. <laughs> which was not my favorite, but I, you know, you did it. Yeah. <laughs> you did what you had to do. So, like now that we kind of wrapped up your, like we confirmed that you were a chemistry major and all like the requirements and stuff. I, I did some research from like your time at the school and you could confirm whether I'm wrong or right in my findings. But I, I found that there were many like of the women during that time were child study majors. So I just wanted to ask you, if you feel that by taking chemistry and being a chemistry major, if you were kind of breaking the mold for women during that time and how you feel about that? Well, you know, it's very interesting because um, it was such a close knit group of people. Um, yes, there were child study majors, but there were also the secondary ed. I think we were called the B plan. It was the A, the A prime plan, the B plan. And, um, so there were child study. Of course, the Dillon Center had not been built yet. It was actually the archery course. I don't know if you know that. Where the Dillon Center was, that was the archery course. So when I was there in my first year, I took archery where the Dillon Center was. And then when I came back, it was the Dillon Center. The Dillon Center used to be downstairs in 245. 
And um, so, yes, there were a lot of child study, but I don't remember it's being um, so pervasive that it was emphasized over everything else. There were history majors, there were math majors, there were English majors. So, yes, there were a lot of child study majors, but um, it seemed to me that uh, whatever you were majoring in was important to somebody. So yes, there were a lot of child study majors, but uh, we were such a, a close knit group that nobody was excluded. It wasn't, oh, there are the child study majors and they go off to that corner and there are the math majors. But it was, it was just a general group that you could go and eat with anybody and sit with anybody in the, in the rec room or the red room or, do you even know where the Red Room is? Do you know the Red Room? Is it still called the Red Room? It's not red anymore, but it's still called the Red Room. Is it? It's probably not red anymore. I don't even think it was red at the second time I went back, but it just took the name. But it, um, yes, there were child study, uh, a lot of child study majors, but there, there weren't distinctions. And in terms of, yes, there weren't many chemistry majors or, uh, and there were more bio majors because that kind of went along with child study. A lot of child study majors had bio and there weren't many chemistry majors, but um, there was a great acceptance and rejoicing in everybody's studies. I'll tell you when I did feel breaking the mold, when I went to get my master's in chemistry, that is when I really felt uh, the difference of being a woman in science because I was one of two women getting my master's in science on an NSF grant. And a lot of the men there felt I was there to do the dishes. So you, you really kind of had to establish yourself then. But at St. Joseph's, there was just a general acceptance that a woman could do anything. And um, I always felt that. Yeah, so I, I kind of relate it to today, like the community hasn't changed that much because even though there's a lot of nursing and child study majors today, I still kind of feel like we all connect at the same level, like even though we're different majors. Yeah, so that was nice to learn. Right. That's right. And it's it's just a general acceptance and rejoicing in whatever anybody is doing. And I, I think that's such a great strength. Were there any other times besides when you were getting your master's that you felt any obstacles or challenges as a woman in STEM? Um, well, another time I went on a physics grant and once again, I was one of the, in fact, I was the only woman. We were divided into groups and I had been teaching physics a long time. And so I was put into the longest group. And again, there's a sense of having to prove yourself. And um, that of course is waning now, but you have to remember how old I am. <laughs> so the, the, this is years ago and that is dissipating. But years ago there was a sense that uh, STEM was not for women and I did feel that. And um, so yes I did go through that. When, uh, when I left the college and, you know, naturally, um, at first I was in a college that was all women. And then when I came back, it was very few men there. But there's still the ethos was that women can do anything. So and then I went to a, an all girls school. So it was still women can do anything. So then when I went into another venue and it was, what are you doing in science? I was surprised. But I think I had the strength and the outlook that I belong here, I can do this. But I think I was surprised to be faced by that.
Do you remember any specific situations where you felt challenged, like maybe someone talked down to you or you, you like felt bad about something, or maybe you thought it wasn't for you at some points? Were there any situations where that like occurred? You mean that science wasn't for me? Yeah. I remember when I was on that, um, it was again, it was an NSF National Science Foundation. Um, there was a time in the 70s when there was a dearth of science teachers. That's probably true now, too. And the Na National Science Foundation was giving grants for people to get their degrees in science and chemistry and physics. And so actually, right after I graduated from St. Joseph's, I got a grant to go on right away for my master's, which was quite a deal because it was for free. And then after I got that, I got a grant to study um, for certification, state certification in physics. And I remember going to Vermont for a course in physics. And I, again, I was the only woman <clears throat> in this grouping because they broke you up according to how long you had been teaching and so forth. And the teacher, sent you to the blackboard, which was kind of unusual in that point. You know, you didn't send graduate students to the blackboard and gave me a, uh, a problem to solve on at the blackboard. Now, that, that was a little unusual for graduate students go to the blackboard. And, you know, usually you do that to high school students who you feel haven't done their homework. Although don't do that to anybody if you're an education major. But anyway, that that was and, and it was kind of a challenge. And um, I was nervous. I was nervous because all these men were looking at me, you know, kind of like, mm hmm. And I was so happy that I was able to do it. I, I mean, it, it was just dumb luck. It really was. But that I was able to do it. So yes, I did feel challenged by that and a little talked down to that, um, you know, we'll see if, if she can do this. So, um, but, but I, I do feel that has dissipated over the years. I just happened to be in the science at a turning point of, of women taking more of their place in science. So, um, you know, it was just a different time, that's all. It was just a different time. So in terms of speaking about your experiences with um, other people, like aside from the women that you had originally gone to school with, we researched how SJC had gone co-ed in 1969. So yeah. we just wanted to know what was it like to be a part of a newly, newly co-ed college, considering you had, so that you had gone there for a year and then you switched schools and then you would come back and it was co-ed. So what was that switch like, especially since you had seen it before it had um, changed? Well, it, when I was there from 65 to 66, I, it, we had so much fun. We, it was just, it, it, we were there from seven o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. Uh, it was, there was just everything going on and we just, uh, it, it was, it was just wonderful. Um, it, you know, this sounds so quaint now, but I was a cheerleader for our basketball team. Now, can you imagine? Um, St. Joseph's had a basketball team. We were cheerleaders. We went all over. And then St. Francis College was an all boys school. And so they decided we we would be their cheerleaders. They asked us to be their cheerleaders. And so we made our cheerleading uniforms. So they were uh, red and blue because ours, were, of course, were gold and white. And then we traveled with them. I, I mean, we had so much fun. And um, it was just, it was wonderful. But then I entered the convent and I came back. And well, there was kind of a, a dress code uh, not like high school. I don't know if any one of you went to a Catholic high school, but it was not like a Catholic high school where, you know, the length of the skirt, although they're, you know, but you were kind of expected to wear stockings and, and it, it was, you know, it wasn't oppressive. Please don't get me wrong, but it was 
And then you came back, I came back rather, in 69, and there were guys there. Now, very few. When it first went co-ed, there were very few there. But I think there was a great effort to make them feel welcome. There really was. There was not in any way an effort to make them feel ostracized. I think there was a sense that they're ours. Now, of course, you kind of sit in the red room and kind of hit elbows with your friend next to you and say, look, there's one. Uh, but it, it wasn't, it, it, it was a sense of making them feel welcome and making them feel a part of the community. But there were not many. But of course, things became relaxed in terms of perhaps dressing and, and so on and so forth. Um, when I was uh, a first year student from 65 to 66, every Monday, you had to put on your academic robe. Have you heard this? And there was an undergraduate, an undergraduate association meeting. Everybody had a, an academic robe. You got that when you first went and um, when the induction, what, what do you call that, that uh, when you welcome to the college? You still have it. I know you still have it. Well, anyway, when you first welcome to the college and we got an academic robe and your initials were embroidered on the inside, you had to wear that every Monday at three o'clock at a UA meeting, an undergraduate association meeting. And you had to go to that. And if you didn't go to that, you got a cut on your first three credit class on Monday. Now that, that's when you had the cut system. And so you had to sit there and the president of the UA, the Undergraduate Association, would do all of the college business at that. Now that was when I went the first time. When I went back, I don't think that was in vogue any longer. So things like that changed when it went co-ed. But it was still the same welcoming community and um, but I think there was a great effort to make the guys feel welcome, that this was their school too. So do you think some of these changes were made because it went co-ed or do you think those changes were kind of already heading in that direction? I think both. I mean, you have to remember it was the 60s too. I, you know, I, I mean, that was quite a time. The 60s were really something. So I, I, th I, that's a good question, Louisa. I think probably it was a confluence of, of events. You have to remember people were marching in the streets and, um, you know, there was just a general sense of, um, you know, I don't want to say disorder, but what are we all about? And... Uh, I, those things would have had to change. So, um, so I think it was a general sense of keeping up with the times and um, I think they would have had to change anyway. So speaking of change, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, I was gonna follow up into how the 70s brought about the student revolution and the civil rights movement. So St. Joseph's aside, what was it like being a student? during the 1970s? Did you feel like the student revolution and the civil rights movement had a significant um, impact on you and your experiences? We were very aware of what was going on. You have to remember it was the Vietnam War also. And I remember, I, and I will give you a date, October 15th, 1969, not quite the 70s, but 1969 at the college, there was a demonstration on the moratorium for the Vietnam War. When I say demonstration, no windows were broken, there were no fires, there was, but there was a general awareness of who we were, our responsibilities as people becoming adults. So it was, um, 
we were aware we were not stopped. We were not in any way uh, hampered, but we also weren't breaking windows. But there was a, a great sense of our responsibilities as people becoming adults. But it was uh, being a student in the 70s. Now, you have to remember, I was a sister of St. Joseph also. So there were a couple of, you know, a, I see I'm the second interview. I don't know who the first was. So, you know, um, maybe somebody who didn't have um, the, the uh, impact of being a sister also. But I mean, we certainly were aware of what was going on. But um, there was a great awakening in younger people of our responsibility of the adulthood that we were coming into, that this world was ours and we better do something about it. So um, to, it, it, there was a responsibility to be aware of what was going on and the war and, um, you know, not unlike some of the things that are happening now with climate change and immigration. And so, uh, you know, the topics may change but the responsibility of young people to be aware and do something about it remains with all of you. So the 70s were wild. The 60s were, they were really something too. So, I mean, listen to some of the Beatles music, uh, you know. I'm really dating myself, but you you started this was with when I graduated from college. So it's not as though I'm hiding it from you. So in your opinion, then, do you feel like these kind of historical events were some that did bring the major changes to the college? Or do you think other things had more to do with um, the changes that went on? Well, as, as they say, the times they are changing. I even remember sitting in the, you probably don't even know that's a song, do you, Bob Dylan? The times they are changing. Um, I remember sitting in the rec hall hearing that song and I think that the leadership of the college was very aware that in order for it to remain vital and vibrant that it would have to listen to the students and listen to the signs of the times to to keep going to attract students but also to nurture their um, responsibility, their interest. There were, you will never know the sisters of St. Joseph who were there and the other wonderful teachers, but they were not um, sitting in the side, on the sidelines, not knowing what was going on. They were vital, they were vibrant. They challenged the students to know, to know current events and to know their responsibility to be part of it. So I would say it was a real, it was a place of coming of age where the students were encouraged to be part of it. And I would say the leadership of the college as well as the professors there were encouraging movement. I don't think they were dragged into it. I think they were going willingly and listening to the signs of the times. So it was always to me a very vibrant place. You know, it wasn't a sheltered, place. You know, some people may look at something that started out in 1916 as an all women's college as a little shelter, and maybe they don't know what's going on. That's not at all what it, what it is and uh, what it was. It was always a vibrant, active place looking to the future. So I know how you said the sisters obviously had a big impact on the students in the college. And we were saying like now only about like seven or eight sisters actually live like in Founders Hall. But at one time there was like 40. 
in the building, yes. it, they had a much larger presence in St. Yes. Joe's than they do now. So yes. did you live on campus or was it when you were in between schools? Did you live somewhere else? Actually, I lived down the block at, um, it was Queen of All Saints Convent. It was 315 Clinton Avenue. I didn't live at the, um, you call it Founders Hall, we called it the convent. Um, actually, also, some of the sisters lived upstairs in 245. They lived where some of the offices are above the parlors. Um, those were their bedrooms. That's how many sisters there were. They were in, uh, you call it Founders Hall, I guess. Yeah. And, um, what do you call, what's Tui Hall? It's still, yeah. I think it's still, yeah, it's still Tui. <laughs> no, it wasn't Tui. What's 245? Burns Hall. Oh, Burns. Burns. What's Tui? Things in the parlor is. Okay. In Tui Hall, above that, sisters lived there on the two floors there. See, I knew Sister Vincent Therese Tui. I know Sister Mary Florence Burns. So they, those names were put on later. We called it 245. We called it the convent. Those names were all put on later. Those names were not there when I was there. But anyway, there were about 40 sisters. And uh, it, they were just all over the place all the time and they energized the school, as did the other wonderful teachers there. They were always available. They were at everything. Um, it was great. It was always alive. So um, you enjoyed convent living? You liked, you know, learning about faith while being with other sisters? Well, I, I did, yeah. I mean, sisters are people. Sisters are people. You know, we have our ups and our downs. But I, yes, I entered the convent and I've been in the convent a long time. You can figure that out too. Any math majors? I forget. Any of you math majors? <laughs> but you can figure that out. Yes, I, I have been very happy in convent life. Yes. And I lived down the block while I was going to the college uh, from 69 to 71. And, um, you know, because as a chemistry major, you have late labs and physics and all of that. So um, I lived right down the block. And uh, so I just had to walk half a block after my late labs and everything. So, but I never lived at the convent. But I did go over and eat lunch every day at the convent. They were very welcoming to me. Um, so like, um, as we mentioned before, uh, I mean, as like, um, like we know before that you're a teacher at, uh, Mary Lewis Academy. Yes. So what, what made you want to go into teaching and did anything specific happen that influenced you to like to start teaching? Um, Edwin, I just had a little trouble. Okay. I can read your question. Okay, you're a teacher. What made you want to go into teaching? Did I? You know, um, it's funny. Um, I love teaching. I, I just love teaching. I love making the subject come alive. I love connecting with students. Any one of you education majors? Anybody? You are, Natalie. Are you a uh, child study or be? your child study. So you're, you're um, and maybe we'll be honoring you in a couple of years as one of these uh, educators of the year, right? That are being honored tonight. Maybe. Um, and maybe, all right, we'll have to remember your name. Um, there is such a reward in teaching people because there is a connection not with material, material is important. Like I loved chemistry from the minute I had it in high school. There was just a wonderful connection that I, I it just, you know when you click with something, 
but then making it come alive to other people. I loved the sense of connecting with young people. I loved watching it, um, watching the aha moment, like I get it, I get it. And if, if, if the way I presented it didn't click, then you get another way and you get, there is such a reward in teaching. And I, I don't know what made me want to teach. Um, at one point I wanted, and I know this question comes later, but I, I will say it now, Edwin, because it kind of comes in here. At one point I wanted to be a physician because I did love science and I wanted to be a physician. Um, but that didn't seem to be in the cards. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard the name Sister John Raymond, um, but she was the long time head of the education department at, at St. Joseph's College. And she was a wonderful teacher. And um, after I had her at St. Joseph's, that solidified my desire to be a teacher just to see how you can connect with students. And you know that when you teach, you change somebody's life forever. You, you just do. I'm sure each of you, if I said to you, think of a teacher that has connected with you, you know that person and those lessons will remain with you forever, even if you are not going to teach. But something about that person, you know, they say you don't remember what a person teaches you, but you remember how the person treated you. And that's going to remain with you forever. And I think that the desire to just connect with students in that way is what made me want to teach. And then after I started teaching, you know, something in me said, this is right. This is right. So long answer, Edwin, to that's what made me want to teach. You yeah, like um you said how like um while we're talking that you love like um teaching especially students how like changing their lives. I just want to know like oh also um like there are times I know like teaching can be difficult like when you have like students that either don't want to learn or like they have like trouble sometimes grasping the information like um how would you also like um, like deal with them like how like, like how would you like deal with those people deal with students who don't want to learn yeah or do you, well you take a deep breath and <laughs> um sometimes what you do what i would do is um i i, I would Ask to see them later. That would be, then you'd see the look of horror on their face. Um, but I, if they don't want to learn, it usually has nothing to do with, with the teacher or the subject. It's usually something else. So, you know, sometimes you just have to wait for another day or, um, you know, it's usually how the student is feeling about him or herself and has very little to do with not wanting to learn. So that's a block. So what you try to do is help the student remove the block. And you try to treat the person well and try to help the student see him or herself in a different way. And usually you get through, usually very, very rarely do you get to a point where you can't reach the student. Does it happen? Yes. And then you just pray and hope somebody else reaches that person. But it's very rarely that you, you know, that the person can't be reached by somebody. Thank you. So speaking of teaching, we have mentioned that you have worked with the Mary Lewis Academy as well as Font Bon Hall Academy. And you have also taught at St. Joseph's and Adelphi University. 
So what are some of the biggest differences and similarities you have experienced while working at the high school level versus the college level? Well, I, just so you know, the uh, course I taught at St. Joseph's was science methods, and that was a while ago. Um, this teaching at St. Joseph's was, um, I, it was interesting. Um, I think the lack of continuity on a college level um, it, it's like a one-shot deal, one course, you don't see them again. Uh, it's not the same as in a high school level, you see them in the hallways, you see them at the basketball game, you see them at lunch, you, you know, the continuity in their lives. And the college, see, when I taught coll the college, it was just a one course, it was science. So I, there wasn't the connection. With Adelphi, I actually taught the course at, at Mary Lewis, and it was Adelphi and St. John's Credit. So I really didn't go to their campuses. I taught the AP Chemistry at Mary Lewis, and it was for Adelphi and St. John's Credit. So I was listed as an Adelphi and St. John's teacher, but I taught it in Mary Lewis. So it was a, it was a little bit different. But teaching college at for St. Joseph's, it was really just a, a discrete course and there wasn't the continuity. It's all about connections. And when you're teaching in high school and you're seeing these students on a, a regular basis and you're seeing them in all different venues, in homeroom, in the cafeteria, at club meetings, at basketball games, there's a, there's a sense of connection. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about relationships. It's about seeing them. It's how are you, you know, and you can see if they're having a bad day, you, you know, and so uh, it's the connection that I like. I kind of have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, do you, what made you want to take that jump from teaching high school to college and like go to that age group instead of staying where you were? Well, I was asked to do it. That's that's what made me do it. And actually, I still was at Mary Lewis when I was teaching the course for St. Joseph. So I did both simultaneously. So um, I didn't really leave. Mary, uh, Mary Lewis teaching science to teach at St. Joseph's. It was done uh, late in the afternoon for the uh, science teachers. So I really, I don't think I would have left teaching high school to teach college. I, uh, because I enjoyed high school too much. So I just did it because I was asked to, because a teacher was needed and I did it. Had I, had it required my leaving, Mary Lewis, I uh, probably would not have done it, but I did it because Sister John Raymond asked me to do it. So, um, we also know that you're a principal at St. Yeah. Mary Lewis Academy. Yes. Can you, just, can you tell us um, how long were you a principal there? I was principal there for 21 years. A lifetime, probably, your, probably more than your lifetime. <laughs> So um, when did you retire from being a principal there? Well, I left there in uh, August of 2018. So what challenges did you face during your time there? And how did your background as a classroom teacher help you in fulfilling the role of being a principal? Well, um, the challenges were always to make sure that I was doing the best I could do for the individual and the community. Um, as Catholic social teaching talks about, we have the dignity of the person and the common good. So you were always weighing each individual and the good of the community. So you were looking at the whole, the whole. The community of students and faculty and then you look at the parents and you look at the other stakeholders the alumna alumni all girls and everybody else dealing with the schools so you're trying to make decisions 
for the common good, but then you're also looking at decisions that affect each individual. So making decisions is a great challenge. Making sure that you're being fair to both of these. And sometimes they were competing because what might seem fair for an individual might not seem fair to the community and vice versa. The other challenges are keeping up with the curriculum to decide what courses should run. How do we keep up with the greatest and the newest curriculum? How do we make sure that these students are receiving the best education that they can? And girls' schools, which we all know from uh, all the data and the studies, are actually the better place for young women in high school and give them the best advantage at, at times are not chosen by young women because they want to be in co-ed schools. And this is not a knock on co-ed schools because there are very, very good co-ed schools. But young women want to be in co-ed schools and yet Single gender schools do a wonderful job in giving young women the uh, confidence in themselves and in all of their abilities. So that was a great challenge. Another challenge that a principal of a Catholic school has is raising money. And that took a lot of my time going to alums and asking them for money, which is not an easy thing. You know, um, the first time I had to go and ask somebody for money, I couldn't even say the number. I had to write it down on a piece of paper and say to this man who was the husband of an alum and say, could you give us this much money? And I had to point to it because I couldn't get it out of my mouth. Now, that was in my first year. After that, I mean, they were afraid to see me coming because I just was able to say, could you give us this much money? And, you know, but that was a challenge. Sometimes it was a challenge with the parents because the parents at times didn't have the same understanding of what we were hoping for. And um, we'll talk about, let's say, um, let's say rap songs. You know, you know the language and the misogyny that are part of rap songs. Well, I think at times, if that's what we listen to, we get used to it. And so we end up saying, well, what's the problem? And I think if we find ourselves getting used to that, it is a problem. And so if I say, now you may be sitting there saying she really is old, but um, if I say, you know, I don't want that here. I don't want the language and I don't want the misogyny. Sometimes people say, but that's what they listen to. And I'm sitting there saying, yeah, but I want them to understand what this gets them used to. And they think it's okay. So that's a challenge. So long answer, Edwin. I keep giving you long answers. I don't know. Thank you. So segueing more into women in leadership, you mentioned that you knew Sister Vincent Teresa Tui. Um, do you have any memories that you could share with us? And were you inspired by her at all at your time at St. Joseph's? Yes, yeah, she was the president when I first started St. Joseph's. 
and um, she was, I don't know how tall she was, but she seemed very tall to me. She was very stately and very dignified. Now you didn't, I did not see her a lot. Um, she was very nice, very soft spoken, but um, I know one of the things that when I was entering the convent, I had to go up and tell her that. That was the expectation. So I had to make an appointment and go up and so on and so forth. And she was lovely. But uh, that is my memory of her. Her office was in 245. And, um, and but you have to remember there was no Patchogue campus at that point. Um, and she lived over in Founders Hall. So you would see her crossing the street and so on and so forth. But that's my memory of her. Uh, I don't know how tall she was, but she looked tall to me. But dignified, distinguished looking, soft spoken. That's my memory. So um, after uh, the next president that came in was Sister George Aiken O'Connor. And do you have any recollect recollections of her at all? Yes, Sister George Aquin was the president, the new president, when I came back in 69. And I had known Sister George Aquin before that. She was a sociology teacher uh, when I was there the first time. And she was very vivacious and, uh, and uh, she's the one who acquired Patchogue. And actually she's the one who invited me to be on the um, board of trustees. I'm on the board of trustees. And uh, she's very vivacious and quick of wit. She was. She was very quick of wit and um, very um, quick of thought and uh, um, very bright and, and um, just a real um, presence. So I know that we've mentioned that you were a teacher and principal of Mary Lewis and Pom Pom Hall. And I also saw that you were a member of the American Chemical Society and Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development. So yeah. I was wondering how maybe the curriculum of Catholic schools has changed through the years of, that you've noticed working as a teacher and administrator. Yes. Well, actually, the curriculum has changed according to the regions. Uh, for the most part. Uh, the Regents curriculum has changed quite a bit over the years and the Regents requirement and the Regents diploma has changed quite a bit over the years. And so the Catholic schools have certainly kept up with that. The required Regents for a Regents diploma have changed, the sequences have changed, the math um, the math curriculum has been through, I don't know what, it has changed so many times, sequential, this and that. You know, it used to be algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and then it went to sequential one, two, and then uh, it, back and forth, and then math A and B, and then and so forth. Um, and uh, then the requirement for a Regents Diploma with advanced designation. So I would really say that the Catholic school uh, diploma requirements have changed with the New York State requirements because, as you know, the Catholic schools are very faithful to giving their students a, uh, a very good and sound foundation. So, and as you know, though, they're always teaching religion and or theology, depending upon what they call it. So, um, they are also doing that. So I would say the Catholic schools have kept up very well with giving a very, very sound um, uh, curriculum. They've also changed in, in uh, following uh, the, the regions and giving uh, the regions dictates in, in giving government 
a course in government and so forth. And um, also the science that uh, physical science is not part of the region's sequence anymore, you know, it's biology, chemistry, and for the region's diploma with advanced designation, now you need a biological and a physical science and so forth. Uh, so uh, it really, the Catholic schools keep up very well with the requirements for the um, region's diploma with advanced designation. So uh, I would kudos to the Catholic schools for continually revamping their curriculum to remain uh, in concert with the requirements. Yeah, I definitely agree. I went to a Catholic high school and I could tell, like I, I would speak to like the sisters and they would say like how much it's changed over the years, how there used to be more religion courses or more sisters, mm -hmm. you know, teaching. But um, yeah, I agree that Catholic schools do a good job of keeping up with New York State requirements. So thank you. Yeah. So, um, so after, um, after dedicating your life to teaching and to the noble service of sisterhood, we, um, you received the St. Bridget Award in 2018. I did. Could, could you tell us a little bit about this award? Um, it's given to educators and, um, you know, I'm always hesitant to get an award. I, I just, you know, um, actually I have to tell you this, when Sister Corday, now, you never heard of her either, did you? She was a longtime physics teacher at St. Joseph's College. And I had her. And when she retired, I wrote her a little note. And, you, you know, you never think that these things mean anything to people. But I wrote her a little note to thank her. Thank you, sister, and so forth. And she wrote back and she said, being thanked for teaching physics for so long at St. Joseph's is like being thanked for eating ice cream. So I just thought, that is great. That's a great line. So when I was you know, they uh, they wanted to give me this award. And that's kind of how I felt. Getting an award for teaching, to me, is like getting an award for eating ice cream. And if you knew how much I loved ice cream, you'd get it. So, uh, but anyway, I uh, they asked me about this award, so I said yes. But when I received the award, I really received it on behalf of all the teachers. And I just said to everybody there, I said, if you can read a newspaper, thank a teacher. If you can go into Macy's and figure out how much 25% off this skirt or shirt is, thank a teacher. All of us can thank a teacher for all that we are able to do. So I really accept these things for all teachers, the unheralded heroines and heroes of our lives, when you think about it. So that's why I'm so happy to be able to go to this gala tonight. That is, do you know about it? The SA non -videri. Tonight is a gala for St. Joseph's College. And the um, awards are for educators from, uh, they're all alumni of St. Joseph's College for all different things, legacy in education, COVID um, award uh, educators who were outstanding during COVID, elementary school teachers, administrators, and so forth. And they were nominated <clears throat> by administrators, friends, colleagues, themselves, self-nominations. But it's so infrequent that teachers are thanked or that teachers are uh, given awards. And when you think of all that you wouldn't, or I, wouldn't be able to do if it weren't for teachers. So in answer to your question, Edwin, that's what the St. Bridget Award was. It was for education. That's really nice. Um, did this award um, like affirm the importance of the work that you have accomplished over your lifetime? 
Well, it was for education and I took it as a broad based award that I was standing there, but it was for educators. So that I was kind of the symbol of other educators. So uh, I was uh, I was standing there, but I had millions of people behind me. In your interview that I read um, with the tablet about getting this award, you said that you never imagined being a sister, but you felt that it was a call that you couldn't ignore. And you mentioned that you were very young when you made that decision. So was there a specific moment that you realized you wanted to be a religious sister or was it something that you'd always thought about? Um, that's such a good question. I've been asked it so many times in my life. Um, did you ever have something that just gnawed at you? If you haven't had it yet, you will. But, I, I, you know, whether it's what major I should have, what guy I should marry, what girl I should marry, which way I should go, which or whatever, what I should do with my life, whatever, what house I should buy, whatever, you know. Something just kind of always right there. And <clears throat> it was, uh, I cannot tell you a specific time. But I was at the college. I, as I had said before, I went to St. Savior. Do you know where St. Savior is? Park Slope, 6th yes. Street and 8th Avenue. And, uh, you know, I was going to the college, St. Joseph's. Um, and uh, I was there and I was having such a good time. I cannot emphasize to you what a good time I was having. Like, it's amazing I tore myself away to enter the convent. But it was something that just was there in my mind and I guess in my heart that I just had to say, I have to try this. It wasn't that I was unhappy and I had a very happy home life and my parents were not thrilled with my decision at all. But it was, there was not a specific moment, but it was just something there saying, I have to try this. I have to do it. It's something that's on my mind and I have to do it. So there wasn't a specific time, a specific moment, but it, it was just something that I had to try to do. Were, were you always religious? Like when you were younger, did you feel this calling or was it after entering St. Joe's and being surrounded by the community? Well, my family was always um, very much involved in our parish. I'm from Flatbush and, um, well, ne although now they call it some Prospect Park South, Dipness Park or some such, I don't know. But uh, my, my parents, my family was always uh, involved with our parish, Holy Innocence. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I would say that we were always, that was always part of our community. However, I lived in an apartment house and we had Protestant people and Jewish people and we were all very, very much a community there. We'd celebrate with one another, Hanukkah and this and that and the other thing. It was, you know, so I had a lot of different influences growing up. So, but, uh, but we were very active in the parish. I did go to a Catholic grammar school. I went to a Catholic high school. So, um, it, religion was a great influence in my growing up. While you were at the college, did you have any friends that were also becoming sisters? Did you attend yes. with any students that were? Oh, yes. Cool. Did you, were you like friends with them? Do you know them personally still or? Yes. In fact, I think there were about five of us who entered the convent at the same time. It was ironic. We didn't all know we were entering. That was the funny part. We didn't all know we were entering. And then <clears throat> you had to go and you had to take a test to enter. And then we all showed up there together. And we were like, oh, you're entering too? We, I didn't know you were in. Oh, you're entering too? And, and we were like, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. So, I mean, we were all friends. But it wasn't something that, you know, was, uh, but we were friends, but I'm the only one who, who's still in. The other people left. So as a sister of St. Joseph's for such a long time, over 50 years, 
Yes. Um, some of the most fulfilling experiences you have had as a sister. Well, I have to say I have been so fortunate that I have loved my ministries. I loved teaching. I loved being the assistant principal at Fanfan. And in fact, I'm going back to Fanfan to uh, more or less team teach uh, a seminar there uh, in January. Uh, I loved being principal of Mary Lewis loved it. So uh, I also was on the leadership team of the Sisters of St. Joseph. I was what in, is known as a counselor to the president. And I love doing that. So if you ask for memorable experiences, I would say I have been so fortunate that I have loved my ministries. I just, I, I just really am so lucky that I have just loved what I have been doing over these, as you would say, Natalie, many years. <laughs> See, when you start off with the year I graduated from college, I mean, really. <laughs> but I've, I would say those are my memorable. I, I just, you know, you hear some people who say, oh, I hate my work. I hate getting up and going to work. And I, I just, I can't imagine. It must be so hard. So I just have been so lucky. Do you have one particular moment from working as an educator or as a principal that is the most memorable or the most fulfilling to you? Oh my goodness. <clears throat> well, let me tell you one that's very recent. I went back to a reunion at Mary Lewis last Saturday, and there were 400 women there. <clears throat> and, um, you know, for some of them, I was their chemistry teacher, their homeroom teacher, their physics teacher, their uh, <clears throat> principal. And this one woman walked up to me and she just said to me, you are the only reason I passed the physics regions. And now, I mean, I don't know that that should be a highlight in my life, but I just, it just made me laugh. And I just, I, I, I don't know if it's a highlight, but it's just a recent, um, you know, it's just a recent thank you, you know. And then some of the women from the class of 75 from Mary Lewis kept saying, come on, you were in our class. You came when we came. So they insisted that I be in their picture because I got to Mary Lewis when they did. So I guess just sometimes the highlights are the appreciation that people have for you that you don't even realize how grateful they are for your presence in their lives. And sometimes you forget it, you know? So it makes you feel good. So we had kind of discussed um, the fact that you said you wanted to become a physician, which yes. is your chemistry degree. But did you have like a specific like specialty in mind? Like, did you want to deal with kids? Did you have any kind of idea? I probably would have been an internist and um, like a GP. That, that's probably where I would have gone. But um, I, I was perfectly happy being a chemistry teacher. So I was interested. I had taken, at the time, as I said, I, uh, because I graduated with 169 undergraduate credits and I had the credits from St. Joseph's and Brentwood College, I had so many credits and so many science credits. I had an exposure to a lot of science credits and um, I was very interested in science and uh, so I was interested in being a physician. But when that didn't seem to be feasible, I was perfectly happy with being a science teacher and I have had it found it to be fulfilling all these years later. 
Yeah, I was going to say I was um, I was happy to hear that you felt that you were still able to get more out of like besides just being assisted, you were still able to teach and do all these other things because it really seemed like you got to make the most out of everything you really enjoyed doing. So it was nice to hear. Yes, thank you. And I'm happy to be able to say it. So we have uh, one kind of interesting question that I kind of came up with off the top of my head when we were making up questions. And okay. if, if you could take one aspect of the St. Joseph's community from your time as a student and implement it into today's community, what would you implement and why? Well, I think it might already be there. And it is the sense of community and the sense of welcome. And I don't know if you know that the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph is unioning love. And the charism that a congregation has is that it's the gift given to be shared with others. And then the mission is how that is lived. And in 1916, the Sisters of St. Joseph started St. Joseph's College. And they started it because there really weren't options for women for college. And they didn't care whether they owned the property or ran the college or whatever. And so if you look at the history of the college, they started it, but they didn't care, <clears throat> you know, whether they were called the presidents or whatever, they started it and they wanted it to go forward. But it has always had the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph. And if you've heard the president, Dr. Bloomgarden speak, he always speaks about the Sisters of St. Joseph and their mission. And so to answer your question, Matthew, the idea of bringing people together I think is what I would want to not only implement, but see continue at St. Joseph's. And I see that every time I'm there, I see people coming together. I see people laughing. I see people in what I would call the red room and the rec room. I see people enjoying. I see people learning. And I see people making a difference to one another. So that is what I would like to see continuing. Because I think that is, in addition to an excellent education, I think that is what St. Joseph stands for. I know that you have the pillars of integrity and intellectual rigor, spiritual depth, social responsibility and service. Now I am reading them. I don't want you to think that I uh, have memorized everything. Actually, I'm, I'm giving a bit of an invocation tonight at the gala. So that's why I had to have the, that written down. But anyway, <clears throat> and I think they are so important to who you are as the students of St. Joseph's College, but I still would boil it down to welcoming others, different, you know, different. Everybody's different, but everybody is welcome. Not making other people the other, the other. And you know what I mean by the other. That no matter who you are, that you are welcome. And we're not looking at differences. He, she, all of the things that people use to make people other. That's not part of St. Joseph. We look for unity. And that's what I would like to see St. Joseph's continue to do. Yeah, I agree. I think that just as, poor, just as important as education is 
so is the community because if there's no community like you could go study you could go do your homework every day but if there's not little campus events or having like a friend group to talk to like it's nothing so thank you that was a great answer Thank you so much, Sister Kathleen, for all of your, your wisdom, your answers. I loved hearing all of it, and I know the rest of the group did as well. Um, any final thoughts you would like to share before we wrap up? No. Where does this go? It's recorded, and then right. I posted on our archives, like online, um, and there's other videos from other recordings that are posted there too and there's gonna be a transcript too yeah okay well i thank you for your uh thought-provoking questions and i'm uh delighted to have to speak to you to to not have to to have spoken to you and i wish you luck in your pursuits and it's always a pleasure to meet the students from St. Joseph's College. And I wish, as I said, I wish it could be in person, but I, I knew I wouldn't be able to make it back and forth. So thank you very much and good luck to you.